important. And that is six ways to kill your church. And uh, the, the graphic up there uh, has gotten considerable amount of feedback this week. Uh, it's been, it's, it's, I've, gotten, I've gotten feedback from, uh, from wow all the way to that's, that's incredibly disturbing. And uh, I even had one person say, uh, is that our church in the background? And yes, it is. And the thing is, what we have to do when we come to church and become part of a church is we have to be life givers. Now, what does this uh, skull and crossbones mean when it's on a medicine bottle? It's poison, right? It's something that if you take it in too large a dose, it can kill you. And sometimes it's up there for the purpose of putting on wounds and sores, but it's not to be ingested because it can kill you. And that is the nature of this graphic today. Is are, there are things you can do in a church that are poisonous, that will kill it, that will destroy its life, that will cause it to be able to or unable to do the things God has called it to do. You would be amazed and astonished at how many times we see church trauma in churches in America and if you all have been here for any length of time, since 1959 when this church opened, there have been several times where this church has experienced some pretty serious trauma and some pretty serious uh, issues that tried to destroy it. So here's, here's what I know. I believe that no Christian wants to hurt their church. I don't think any Christian wakes up in the morning and thinks, how can I absolutely destroy and decimate my church? I don't think that's on any Christian's mind. What I do think is there are Christians that get frustrated and they don't know how to handle their frustration. So they handle them in ways that aren't healthy and sometimes they commit things that kill the church and they don't even realize it. Does that make sense? Sometimes we don't even realize what we're doing. Sometimes we don't realize what we're doing is harmful. And sometimes we just think, I'm frustrated, I don't know how to handle these things. And we do things that are, that are devastating. Hopefully today I can help you handle any potential frustration or misunderstanding without them becoming church killers. Because let's be honest, how many of you in your Christian life have been frustrated at some point with your church? Raise your hand. Okay, it's Everybody. And see, when that frustration comes, you are at a critical fork in the road. You have a choice. Am I going to be a church killer or a church life giver? And how you handle your frustrations may be the difference between whether you bring life into a church or whether you bring death to a church. And here's a real bummer, is there's a lot of churches that don't die. They don't close their doors. They just simply kill people and kill life and kill the spirit and they exist until one day eventually they shrivel down to nothing. And ultimately, if they don't change, they will eventually close their doors. Now, I think there's something very important to note. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said that upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, what was the confession that Peter made? He said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. So Jesus was saying, upon the statement that he was the Christ. See, Jesus is saying, I'm not going to let my church die. Amen? I'm not going to let my church die. However, do you realize that 4,000, everybody say 4,000. 4,000 churches in America close every year. 4,000 churches. 4,000 congregations, many of them just like this one. Many of them have people in the seats with hopes and dreams and desires for their community who love their church, who love the people in their church, but somehow, some way, something sapped the life out of it. It stopped growing. It became internal. And the next thing you know, it began to shrink and shrink and shrink, and shrink until the point of death. I've got friends that are here today that are here as a result of a church closing. I've got friends that are here today that weathered some storms and some very difficult situations in churches and had to leave because they were in a toxic, poisonous culture. 
I've got friends here today that survived Lakeside's very own toxic culture about seven years ago. So here's what I know. Jesus said you can't kill the church because it's built on him. But there are things that cause local churches to die. See, the overall mission, the church is alive. The church is strong. The church is worldwide. The church isn't going nowhere. However, it grieves me when I hear of a church that closed. I want you to think about this. There was a church in Campbellsville, Kentucky that closed a few years ago. And when the officials went in to clean out the church to sell the building, they went into the nursery and saw a Noah's Ark painting on the wall that was hand done. And the leader, his name is Neil Gordon, he said he wept. Because they were selling something, someone had a dream in that room. Somebody had a passion for children in that room. Somebody had an idea in that room. And now that church was gone. And you know what I can't imagine? I can't imagine the last year that church existed, members walked in and said, I hope our church closes its doors this year. I can't imagine that happened. And you may look around and see us, and I mean, we're three quarters full. We've probably pushed in 200 today, counting children and everything, thinking there's no way that could happen here. And, and while I'd like to agree, Glory Land Harvest and Radcliffe had 500 people, not just a few years ago, and closed their doors. It's, un- it's unfathomable to me. I, 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 I cried when I saw that article in the newspaper because that was a powerful, influential church that's closed, just closed its doors. And I thank God there's another church. I thank God that St. Stephen's Baptist Church was able to come in and buy that church and, and be able to utilize that building, but to see a vision die. I remember hearing Jacob Pierman on the radio, and he would say, God has given me a mission to reach the city of Radcliffe. And now he's selling cars. I just, it, it's, it's astounding to me. And the only way that can happen is there has to be some sort of toxic environment that's allowed. Something comes in and disrupts the unity of the church because unified churches don't close, folks. It just, it just doesn't work. And I don't know what happened. And I don't know who's to blame. And ultimately, it really doesn't matter because Satan is the author of all disunity. He's the author of all confusion, and he is, the, he is trying to shut churches down. So, I believe these are six ways that that can happen. And if I could retitle the message, I would say six things not to do. Because they're a bad idea. But again, I, just want, I, I can't imagine there was anybody in Gloria Land Harvest that thought, you know, I hope this is the year our church closes. I hope this is the year our pastor's vision dies. I hope this is the year that everything we dreamed about and everything we hoped for doesn't happen. And I can't imagine that's on any of your minds today. I imagine when you come here on Sunday morning, it's a sacrifice to get yourself up, to get your children up, to get yourself dressed. Many of you overcame obstacles and frustrations. Many of you have problems in your families. Many of you have financial difficulties and things going on in your life. And you come here hoping Hoping there is something beyond those problems. You don't walk in here thinking, what can I do to wreck things today? I know that's not on your heart. However, we have to be careful because every one of us raised our hands when we said, how many times at some point have you been frustrated with your church? And I raised my hand. And I was the pastor. And I was frustrated with my church. Can I be honest? Our church was going through such a difficult time, and the folks that have been here the whole time, they're probably sick of hearing about it, but I was at a soccer game, and there was a young man that was, you could tell he was hurt by church, and he found out I was a pastor, and he started talking to me, and we struck up a relationship, and I went and saw him every game because his son was on the team, my son was on the team, and he started talking about wanting to get back in church, and this is when our church was going through turmoil. And he was starting to ask me about our church. And I said, I'll tell you what, if I were you, I would try Lifeline. 
I was the pastor, and I couldn't even recommend my own church because the environment was so toxic. Now, I thank God we're not there today. But here's what I'm trying to say. There were beautiful people that attended this church, and I think none of them had intentions to destroy this church. I don't think any of them, I think all of them thought they were doing the right thing. Is that fair? I think everyone thought they were doing the right thing. Everyone thought they were defending the cause of God. The problem is no one was in unity. So, how to kill a church. Number one, be a gossip. Let me take you to scripture. It says, a gossip betrays a confidence, so avoid a man who talks too much. Here's another interesting thing about a gossip. It says, when words are many, sin is not absent. So how can you determine if you're a gossip if you talk too much? Amen? Sometimes we just need to shut up. I'm serious. I'm, I'm really, and the thing is, I, I prepared this message and I kept telling myself, this is not going to be a Debbie Downer Sunday. <laughs> you know, um, this is going to be encouraging because I'm going to give you some things that can help. Because see, here's the thing. I don't think there's a single person in this room today that says, I want to be a gossiping slanderer that causes trouble and dissension in the church and causes a split. I don't think there's anyone that has that heart, but maybe there's somebody in here this morning who say, I'm frustrated and I don't know what to do with my frustration. Maybe, maybe that'll represent, maybe I can spare you from the heartache of being a gossiper. This is a gossip betrays the confidence in Proverbs 20, 19, so avoid a man who talks too much. And in Proverbs 10, 19, it says, where words are many, sin is not absent. But he who holds his tongue is wise. Sometimes it's better just to say nothing. Proverbs 26, 20, or 16, 28 says, A perverse man stirs up dissension, and a gossip separates close friends. Now let me say what gossip is. Okay, gossip is slander. It's when you try to say something for the purpose of damaging someone. For the purpose of making them look less than in your eyes, especially if that person is not present. I've heard it said, if, it isn't, if it's true, it's not gossip. I've also heard, well, I'm just sharing my opinion. And see, those things can be very dangerous. Even if the information is true, if it is damaging, it should only be shared with those who can fix the problem. Here are some examples of gossip. Did you hear what the pastor said today? Or, you know the pastor didn't blank today? The pastor didn't come visit me today? The pastor didn't do this today? The pastor didn't meet my expectations today? And you're not talking to the pastor. That's gossip. It's slander. And it's murder. Because Jesus says that if you hate your brother, then you're murdering them. And if you talk about your pastor... When your pastor isn't present and you're talking to other people, then you're slandering his name and you're murdering your church. Because here's the thing. What if the people in your audience don't attend your church and they hear you slandering the name of your pastor and ultimately the name of your church? Are they going to be inclined to come to know Jesus? So you're not just damaging the reputation of your pastor or ministers in the church. You're damaging the reputation of Jesus. You're slandering the very thing Jesus loves, and that is his church. Slandering your church direction. I don't agree with the vision. I don't agree with the direction this church is going. I'm tired of them doing blank, and I don't agree with this thing, and I don't agree with that thing, and I don't agree with that thing. Now, if you're in my office, pastor, I just don't agree with that thing. You know what we can do? We can come to an agreement. You know, brother, I see your point of view. However, here is why we're doing such and such a thing. And then we come to a place of mutual understanding, right? Then we come to a place where we talk it out, and one, both of us can't be right. And God's trying to help us both, right? So if both of us can't be right, and God's trying to help us both, one of us is going to see our error. Yes? 
And then we both love Jesus, so when we see our error, we're not going to want to continue in error. So we're going to say, I'm either going to say, you know what, you're, you're right. Or I'm going to say, you know what, you're wrong. Or you're going to say, you know what, Pastor, or maybe neither of us are right, neither of us are wrong, we just misunderstood the situation. But if you want to kill your church, slander your pastor, slander your church's vision and direction, slander your brothers and sisters in Christ. Did you see what sister so-and-so was wearing on the stage today? I tell you what, my goodness. <laughs> you know, we, remember when we heard that at a church, two ladies during an altar call. There were two young girls that were, apparently, we weren't at the church, that were wearing, remember when them low rider pants were real popular? And apparently they were at the altar, and while they were at their altar, their necessities were showing. I don't know what else to say. Their, their, their stuff was hanging out. And these two old ladies, would you see them two nasty little women dressing like a bunch of skanks? And I'm like, they were at the altar. They were at the, they were at, where else do you want them? I don't care what's hanging out. If they're at the altar, we'll cover it up for them. Amen, we'll help them out. Let's recognize what's going on. Maybe they realized what they were doing and they were repenting before God. You don't know what's going on in their lives. And sometimes we just slander people that are just looking for answers. Well, I wish they wouldn't come to church dressed like that. I'm just glad they're here. Amen? I'm just glad that they're somewhere where they can be, receive a message of hope and hopefully nobody looks down their nose at them. Now, if it's a deacon or a, you know, a, a pastor, we may want to address the issue. But if it's somebody we've not seen or somebody new or somebody just doesn't know, um, you could at least gently get a woman to go up to him and talk to him say, honey, look, you got some things hanging out in the back. I'm going to cover you up. And uh, don't think anything of it. You know, there's, there's, there's tactful and kind ways to, but sometimes it's like, dude, put your eyes away. Control yourself. Stop being lustful. Look up. We have a beautiful ceiling. Everybody look up. We got a beautiful ceiling. There ain't no body parts up there. So if there's a problem down here and it's distracting you, just look up. Now again, if it's a leader, it might need to be addressed. But don't take it to the church foyer or to Rafferty's and say, do you see how so-and-so was dressed? Take it to the worship leader. And be humble. There is nothing worse than somebody coming to you with an ag uh, accusation who's arrogant and brash and angry. It makes me not want to listen to you. But when you come in humble and saying, Pastor, I, I noticed something and I've just, it's really got me struggling. And can we sit down and talk? Of course I'm going to talk to you. Another way to be a gossip is fault finding in everything and everyone and just sharing your opinion. Oh, I'm just giving my opinion. I'm not gossiping. Sharing a rumor before you even find out if it's true. You would not believe how many things I've had in my office, and when the person comes in, there is either no truth to it or it was misunderstood. And there was this big gossip tree that was growing and getting out of control, and it wasn't even true. So let me give you an alternative. See, Jesus gives us answers in everything that we do. Matthew chapter 18 verse 15 through 17, because let's say you have a legitimate concern. Let's say you see something going on that is a legitimate problem. How do I handle that? What do I do with my frustrations, pastor? Because I see things going on that I don't like. I see problems. And Matthew said, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. So first you go to that person and say, person, I got a problem. Here's some things that are going on and they involve you. And you know what may happen between that? There will be some dialogue. And the person may not have realized what they were doing, or maybe it was you that misunderstood. How many have ever went to somebody with intentions to rip their heads off because they did something so dumb you couldn't believe it, and then when you got there, they gave you the explanation. It was like, oh, that makes sense. Am I the only one that's ever happened to? Ready, on a war path. Then I get there and I sit down and they tell me and I'm like, oh boy, I was about to do something really stupid. Do you realize talking to people fixes a lot of problems? Yeah, then it goes on and it says, 
If he listens to you, you've won your brother over. It's over. Stop talking about it. Stop talking about it. He goes on and says, but if you will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, don't just take any old body along. Don't take gossip number one, gossip number two, and gossip number three. All right? Take some folks that are mature. Grab some leaders at the church. Grab some trusted people and say, hey, I've got a problem. I went to so-and-so, and I pointed out their error, and they, they won't listen. Can you help me? And then you set up a meeting. And you all sit down together, and you reason it out. And then the leader may say, oh, you know what? You weren't seeing this thing clearly. I may be able to help you. Or they'll correct the brother or sister that's in error. And then Jesus says, if that doesn't work, there's a next step. Then tell it to the church. And if you refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. And see, the thing is, the problem with gossips is they do it backward. First, they treat them like a pagan and a tax collector. Run around slandering them and talking about them. Then they tell it to the church, whoever they feel like. Then it gets to the leaders. Then it gets to the person. And the person is devastated. And the person leaves. And the person is wounded. And the person doesn't even know if they want to go to church anymore because they tried that and they got ran out of the place because they made a mistake or because they had something in their lives that didn't line up and no one had the nerve to talk to them. Gossips always get it backward. So folks, if you see a problem in the church, come and talk to the person with the problem. Here is the difference between a gossip and a person with a concern. A gossip goes to people who have no power to change the situation for the purpose of getting people on their side. A concerned person goes to the person who has power to change things or even know whether or not it's true, amen, with hopes to restore unity. I want to fix this. Not I want to gather people in my team so we can all show how bad this person is. You wouldn't believe how many people with spiritual forks, pitchforks and, and torches have been attacked over something it wasn't even that big of a deal, or maybe they weren't even doing, or maybe it was a big deal, but it just wasn't handled properly. So Jesus gave us an alternative. Now, and here's another thing I want to address. Everybody say vent. Everybody say it again, vent. Everybody needs to vent. Everybody needs that one person in your life that you trust, that you can go before the, the thought has processed in your mind, and you really even know what's going on, and you can go to that person and say, I so frustrated get it off your chest and that's why I always tell the board in board meetings I always tell them if we deal with a private matter concerning a person's personal life it cannot leave this room I said however your spouse does not count in other words you need that one person that can help you carry that issue and you may say I don't have a spouse and you find a trusted friend you find someone that's trusted that you can share your burdens and your frustrations with so you can air it out and vent it out before it causes you to explode. So I'm not saying you can never, ever talk about your frustrations unless you come to the pastor or to the person. But what I am saying is you better be careful. And you better have that one person that you go to that you trust with your life that you can tell anything to and say, I need to know what to do. I'm so frustrated. And then just vent to them. Now, if it's a good friend, they're going to advise you to go to the person. But at least you've got a counselor that's helping you. The best way always is to go to the person that has offended or has hurt or that has done something wrong. However, sometimes you need a sounding board. Amen? A person you can go to. And if you're married, that, person per that perfect person is your spouse. Because you and your spouse are one. There is nothing you should hide from your spouse. Nothing. Amen. Amen? Right. Now, there are sometimes you have to wait to reveal the information because you've got to process it yourself. Um, for example, some years ago, um, we had a staff member at our church in Burksville that was fired. And because the information hadn't quite gotten to the place where it could be released yet, I didn't tell my wife right away. I kind of waited and let some things happen, and then I told her about it. And there's been several instances where there have been things I haven't told her right away, but I've never hidden anything from her. 
Because sometimes you've got to let some things process first before you can let that information out to another person. And I spent a little while on this because I believe this is the number one killer of churches, gossip. And I, if you're a gossiper, and I know every gossiper doesn't think they're a gossiper. They just think they're sharing their feelings. Or, well, it's true, so it's not gossip. Or, or there's some excuse they give to the reason as to why they bring those toxins and poisons into another person. Because you know what you do when you gossip to another person is you bring your issue and make it their issue. Because, you know, let's just say that you don't like the way I comb my hair. Which I can't imagine you would see many other options, but let's just go with that, right? <laughs> but you don't like the way I comb my hair. And you go to the person and say, you see how the pastor combs his hair? Isn't that just stupid? And that person's like, you know, I've never noticed that before. It is pretty stupid. Then all of a sudden you got somebody on your side who didn't have a problem with me before. Thank you. I appreciate that. I was fishing for a compliment. I tell you, it's a, I was hoping somebody would come through for me. Fine friends y'all are. Thank you, Miss Judy, for that wonderful compliment. Are you feeling me? Do you hear what I'm talking about? This is critical. This is important, and I think that we have to get a handle on this because there are alternatives to gossip. Go to the person. Now, I'm going to give all of you all some pristine advice on how to become a gossip killer. Are you ready? Number one, always be quick to forgive. If you've got an offense, just forgive the person before you even talk to them. Just say, you know what? I forgive them. I'm going to exercise mercy. I'm going to exercise grace. I'm going to hold against them. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Boom. Right? There's one way. Another way is if the person that's gossiping is not you. Let's say it's another person that's coming to you. There was a lady that went to my first church. And my pastor, Pastor Carol, he's a bit of a live wire. And sometimes he puts his foot in his mouth and he, he says things he didn't exactly mean it that way. And people will take that and try to run with it. And there was this sister that called me. And she just started slandering him. Do you hear what he said? Do you hear what he did this? And well, I'm leaving the church and I'm free as a bird. And I said, sister, that's wonderful. I said, but how about this? I know where you live. I'm going to go get the pastor and we're going to come to your house and we're going to sort this out. Oh, no, 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 no. She didn't want no part of that. Because see, a gossip doesn't want to confront the issue. They just want to slander the person's name. So if you ever hear someone gossiping, if it's about your pastor, if it's about a friend, or if it's about anybody, say, oh, sister, I'm so glad you brought this concern to my attention. Let's go right now and get in my car, and let's go to the pastor's office, or let's go to that person's house, and let's talk to them about this issue. If they want to deal with the problem, they'll go with you. If they don't, they're going to run the other way. And that sister called me again. And I told her, I said, sister... Don't ever call me again. I don't want to hear what you have to say about my pastor because I love him. And I will not listen to anyone slander or gossip about him. Well, you know, I never heard from her again. Never heard from her again. You protect people and gossips won't come around you. If you are surrounded by gossips all the time, I've got some pretty bad news for you. You're probably a participant. Amen? Let me move on to the second thing. And again, folks, be encouraged because the solution is simple. Just go to the person. Tell them, I love you too much to let this have a wedge between us. I love you too much to let this bother me. Can I talk to you? And if that person is reasonable, they're going to sit down and listen to you. And if they're unreasonable, then you follow the steps Jesus gave you, right? Take somebody with you and then tell it to the church. And tell it to the church doesn't mean get up and say, so-and-so is doing it. No, it means to take it to the church leadership so the church leadership can handle the problem publicly. Because sometimes you have to publicly say, so-and-so was a cancer to this church and so-and-so had to be asked to leave. Here is the thing. I, whenever dealing with problems, I've always seen them usually end after step one. Once they are confronted, if they don't want to deal with the problem, they'll leave the church. Period. Step, or I'm sorry, number two thing to do, <laughs> and that was a lot of fun, not? <laughs> number two, in addition to being a gossip, if you want to kill your church, reach your zero. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, 
Jesus. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Now, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. Lo, I'm with you always, even till the end of the age. I'm going to say, Pastor, you throw that verse in almost every sermon. Well, it is kind of our theme. <laughs> so you're probably going to hear it fairly regularly. And what am I saying? Reach your zero. In other words, consider faith in Christianity a private matter that doesn't need to be pushed on others. Be an incognito Christian. I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to cause any problems. I just want to kind of be here. I want to love Jesus, and I want to be left alone. There's no such thing. I will say this. A church that ceases to evangelize will cease to exist. It will die. If we are not reaching new people for the cause of Christ, the church will die. Now, I agree. Don't be pushy and belligerent. But it's vital important that you're open and obvious about your Christian faith. I'm going to say that again. It's vitally important that you're open and obvious about your Christian faith. People should detect it. Church growth isn't the goal. You all know that, right? Reaching the lost is the goal. But reaching the lost will naturally result in church growth, and growing churches don't die. So what's the alternate to reach your zero? Well, you know, reach your five. Everybody has people in your life that don't know Jesus. Be out there. Be obvious with your faith. Be intentional with your faith. And let people know, I love Jesus. And be a shining example of who Jesus was. And live for him publicly and passionately. And you will see people attracted to you. Amen? Amen? So what's the alternative? Reach your zero? Go out and reach your community. Go out and reach your workplace. Go out and reach your school. Live Jesus in front of people. And guess what will happen? They'll start asking you questions. So that was a quick one. Number three, give your zero. So be a gossip, reach your zero, give your zero. Now I want to read a text to you that I found very interesting. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 through 13. It says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So Paul is saying here, look, don't give because you feel obligated. Give because it brings you joy. And then it goes on, it says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So basically he's saying God will supply everything you need. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for the food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. So not only is Paul saying that your barns will be fuller, but your spirit will be fuller. You'll have a more righteous spirit. It says you will be made rich in every way, physically and spiritually, so that you can be generous on every occasion. Now, I will say the definition of rich in some people's minds is very different because I consider myself very rich, and there are people in this church that probably make way more than I do. But I have a roof over my head. It doesn't leak. All my children have a bed. We were able to pile in my living room on a Friday night and have popcorn and candy and watch a terrible TV show, by the way. I do not recommend it. Um, <laughs> However, I'm blessed. You know what? I don't have silver and gold and all these different things, but I'm blessed. And I'm blessed because I tithe. I'm blessed because I give God his part. And he takes care of me and he meets every need that I have. You know, it's really cool. I can drive a car to work and there's still one at my house for my wife to drive. Don't tell me I ain't rich. I am so blessed. God has been so good to me. Don't tell me that when I come home, my little seven-year-old kid nearly knocks me out the door, hugging me and screaming, Daddy, that I'm not rich. Don't tell me that when I come home, my 13-year-old son wants to talk my head off about things I don't really care about. But the fact that he loves to talk to me, don't tell me I'm not rich. When I wake up in the morning and my little girl comes bouncing in the bedroom and dives in the bed and hugs us both up, don't tell me I'm not rich. When I look at my wife today and know that in two months, we're going to get to start this journey all over again. <laughs> Don't tell me I'm not rich. God has been good to me. Amen? No, I'm stopping. Trust me, I'm stopping. I'm stopping. I don't need no help knowing how to stop, too, because then got it figured out, then got the appointment. God is good. <laughs> hey. If that's too much information, I am sorry. I don't care. The store is getting closed. 
<laughs> I don't need no more help. Thank you for the compliment. Uh, oh, Jesus. So be a gossip. Reach your zero. Give your zero. But going on, listen to what it says. I was still in the middle of a verse, by the way. I didn't forget. ADHD at your service. It says, you will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Now listen. It says, this service you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing with many expressions of thanks to God, because the service by which you proved yourselves, men will praise God for obedience that accompanies your profession or confession of the gospel, and for your generosity in sharing with them and everyone. See, Paul is saying that giving is how the ministry survives. It's because of giving that supplies the needs of God's people. So number one, my wife always says, you repeat yourself a lot. I just want y'all to know I do this on purpose. I ain't forgot what I said. It's just I know people are forgetful, right? If you want to kill your church, be a gossip. Reach your zero. Give your zero. And then number four. Pay zero attention to the community. Now, back to giving. The alternative to giving your zero is giving generously. Be generous. Give, give what you can. Some people say, you know what, I can't tithe. Well, I don't believe that that's true for anyone. I think everyone can, but if you can't, start with something. But pay zero, number four, pay zero attention to your community. See, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16, he said, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. And he says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and hide it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And Jesus is talking about we are public. As a church and as Christians, we are public. We are to be seen. We are to make a difference. We are to add flavor. We are to bring light. People are to look at us and they are to see something that is life-giving and different. This church exists on this location. When I speak of this church, I'm talking about this building. Everyone here knows that people are the church. This building was put on this location by God for the purpose of helping meet the needs of this community. Amen? So if we care nothing about the community that we are in, the church will eventually die. This church is part of the community. So what's some alternates besides the church just sitting here and not doing anything or doing zero for the community? And there's a few things we do. This last Christmas, we had the privilege of helping a foster care uh, system give gifts to about 300 and some foster children. We just wanted to shine our light. And say, hey, there's a church on Ring Road called Lakeside Worship Center that cares about you. And we gave a bunch of gifts. It was really incredible, the response we got. And then a few of us went up and volunteered and set up the Christmas tree and hung up little gloves and hugged some necks and let everybody know we appreciated them. And then the second round came in, and they came in, and they, they pulled off the event. And that's one way. You, see, here's the problem. A lot of Christians complain about problems and present no solutions. No, well, I'm tired of, of uh, children being caught up in, in, in situations that are not good for them. Well, there's a foster system that's designed to help with that. We have good foster parents that attend this church. I want to breathe wind into their sails and encourage them because I want kids to have a good forever home. That's the goal, is to have a good forever home. And, and Paul and Darlene have given a forever home to some really good kids. And I'm glad they're part of this church. And, and Aubrey likes me now, so that, that, that makes me happy. I used to not, I got that candy machine. That candy machine has changed everything in my relationship with kids, I'm telling you. But what are some ways to be salt and light besides foster care? What about attending pro-life rallies? Or if nothing else, we have a family here that's very passionate about um, pro-life rallies. Fund them. I think we raised a couple hundred dollars for one of our uh, walkers this year for pro-life. But even more, attend these rallies. Um, go to anti-drug rallies. If the police call an assembly to try to bring peace to the community, attend those things. And let them know the church cares about peace and safety and these various things. 
Another way to be salt and light is using Facebook and social media. Present positive things. Let people know. Now look, I know we live in a difficult world, and all of us have political views, and it's okay to share those political views. Amen? Just don't let that be what defines you. Don't let that get you sucked into a trap to where you're always complaining on Facebook. Let them know about your faith in Jesus. Let them know about your hope in the cross. Let them know about things that are going on in your church that you're excited about. Um, have programs that invite people to come. We have a food bank. We have a fall festival. We have July the 4th. We have character kids. We have all these different things that go on. And it's funny because the character kids conference we have every year usually has about 50 kids. And most of them are from other than this church. It's amazing the amount of people that come in and they hear about Jesus and they see a big goofy dog and cat and, and they get to take part in something that's pretty incredible. And those are things that we can be a part of that can show that we care about our community. That we care about, and doing this GPA event and inviting uh, teachers and administrators to come and receive prayer, it says we care about this community. And I think it's important that we send a message that we care about this community. I'll never forget one time Beth and I came here to watch the fireworks on July the 4th. Now everybody, y'all know I'm a spiritual man, right? Judy, will you help me out? Thank you, thank you. Only one person going to help me. I'm going to get me some help. I'm a spiritual man. And we came to the church on July the 4th to watch the fireworks in the parking lot was packed. You know what my first reaction was? I was mad. What are these jerks doing using this parking lot? Didn't ask nobody's permission. And then immediately the Holy Spirit said, why are you mad? They're here. I was like, you're right. <laughs> so you know what we did next year? We set up a hot dog roast and we set up and when they parked, no strings attached, we just loved them. What not? They're already here. I don't even have to say, y'all need to come. We just show up and there they come. It's pretty great. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Because I was about to think, well, I'm getting a tow truck. We're taking care of this business. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit reminded me, don't rob yourself of a blessing. Reach out. Show your community you care. Now you get to park and walk to the park. You can park, walk to the park with a hot dog and a soda. Because there's a church that cares about you. And we give away ice creams and just different things. And it's not a whole lot of work. We just show up, light our little fire, roast our weenies, and people just show up. It's awesome. I wish it worked for Sunday. But this also applies to your personal community. There are people in your life that don't know Jesus. And another way you can show you care about your community is care about the people God put around you. It's also called Reach Your Five. You ready for repeat? Be a gossip. Reach your zero. Give your zero. Pay zero attention to the community. And be a hypocrite. The good news is there's only two more repeats. Be a hypocrite. And again, we're talking about things that will kill the church. These are things you should not do. Matthew 7, verse 1 through 5. This is the most misinterpreted scripture today in, 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 in the world, I believe. It says, do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your eye? You hypocrite, which is what this text is dealing with. This text is talking about hypocrisy. Take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. It doesn't say leave your brother in their fault, right? It doesn't say leave them uncorrected. It says check your own closet. Make sure you ain't doing the same thing. Make sure you're not being a hypocrite. Make sure you're not looking down at your nose at somebody while you're doing the same thing. Check yourself out first. And say, God, do I have anything going on in my life? Because, Lord, I want to minister to this brother or this person that's having a problem. So if you want to kill the church, call yourself a Christian, but don't do anything to carry the quality of Christ. Be vocal and judgmental, yet have massive amounts of skeletons in your own closet. A hypocrite is not someone who struggles with sin. A hypocrite is not someone who makes a mistake. A hypocrite is someone that pretends to be something they are not while looking down their nose at someone else. How dare you do that? I can't believe you would stoop to that level while you've got junk going on in your own life that you're refusing to deal with. So this, this verse doesn't mean you cannot confront issues. It's just saying confront your own first to make sure you're not being hypocritical. Amen? So be a hypocrite. I think there is nothing more damaging to a church than its members being one thing inside the church and being another thing outside the church while pretending they are what, while they're in the church. In other words, pretending they're righteous when they're not. And then they go to their workplaces. 
and they go to the stores, and they go to all these different places. Well, I never. Look at that girl doing blah, blah, blah. And Look at that guy doing blah, blah. And then you go home, and you've got, you know, your TV shows you shouldn't be watching. You've got your beer in the fridge that you shouldn't be drinking, and you've got all these things going on in your house that shouldn't be going on, and yet you're looking down your nose at the person that's struggling. That's what Jesus is addressing. You realize you're a Christian 24-7, right? That includes when you're an actor on a TV show. I was, I was really disappointed. I'm not going to lie. I was really disappointed in the TV show. But uh, it includes when you're on Facebook. Amen? I worked in twice this week. Y'all should be proud of me. That makes up for the week I missed. <laughs> Let me just make this statement. Then I'll work my way to the finish. I wonder if anyone would be shocked if they realized you attended this church. Or how would someone, knowing you attend this church, view this church? That's important. So the thing is, don't be a hypocrite. What's the alternative? Examine your own life first. Say, Jesus, I, I want to make sure I'm good. I want to make sure there are things that, that the things in my life are lined up because I want to be able to help people. So Lord, I look and examine my own self. When I ask people, that aren't part of a church, what, what's your biggest problem with the church? You know what they always say? They're the most judgmental, condescending people I've ever met in my life. And I'm like, wow, it stinks. Let's look at ourselves because, see, there, you know how you can not be viewed as judgmental? Two words. Be humble. Don't rant, don't rave, don't say, them gays are killing the, killing the country. No, it's the church's lack of action that's killing the country. It's the church sitting and whining like they don't have any hope that's killing the country. It's the church forgetting about whose name they're calling on that's killing our country. You get the church woke up and realize who they are in Christ, and you will see things change in this world. Amen? Amen? The gays ain't killing it. The church is killing it. Be a gossip. Reach your zero. Give your zero. Pay zero attention to the community. Be a hypocrite. And then the last one, y'all ready for this? Only support church activities that cater to your preferences. Yeah, ouch. Second, or I'm sorry, Philippians 2, verse 3 and 4. It says, do nothing. Listen to this. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourself. Each of you should not look only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. You know what that text is saying? You should care about what other people care about, not just what you care about. Now, many times there are going to be church events that happen. And they're not going to fit your style. They're not going to fit your taste. I'm going to tell you, John Helton schedules some concerts that hurt my head. But I go to them. You know why? Because I believe in John. John has a heart for people. He has a heart for the lost, and he wants to see this community radically changed. So he schedules concerts in hopes that just one lost person will come and identify with a group that I don't like and hear a gospel message and get their life changed. You know what? I don't like the music, but I like that guy. Are you hearing me? And you know what people see when you don't support them? They say, I don't like you. Because that can be the only reason you wouldn't support something. I don't like you. I don't believe in you. You realize everything we do is for the benefit, right? We do nothing flippantly or without concern. And we understand not everything is going to be something everyone personally enjoys. This church does a lot of things I don't particularly enjoy. But because I believe in the people, I support the events. Here's some reasons I've heard as to why people say I don't want to support a particular event. I don't have kids, so I don't need to support that. You know what you're telling every kid in this church? I don't care about you. I only care about me. If it doesn't involve me, I'm not going to support it. I don't like Jewish stuff. 
So I'm not going to come to anything Jewish. But you need to go home because Jesus is Jewish. I don't like that type of music, so I don't do some concerts. I just explained that one. I've already learned about that topic, so I don't need to hear that. So I'm going to stay home that week. So what you're saying is, I will only support things that cater to my preferences, and I don't care otherwise. This is a signal to those the event is geared toward that you don't care about them. Do you want to kill the church? Let the children know you don't care about them. Let the youth know you don't care about them. As Christians, we should support everything our schedule allows. Now, let me give you the alternative. You may say, well, Pastor, I work, and I can't come to all these events. Then at least send a clear signal to that leader. Give them a call, send them a note on Facebook, say, hey, brother, sister, I can't make it because I've got such and such going on. But I want to tell you, I got your back. I'm praying for you. I support you. I'm here in spirit. As a matter of fact, here's 20 bucks for your event to get an extra whatever you need. I want you to know I got your back even though I can't be there. You realize the life that would breathe into that leader? And you ain't even there. You just expressed your support by telling them, hey, I got you. And if I could have been there, I would have. I got you. It speaks volumes. It speaks volumes. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. Being part of a church is a privilege. And nobody is perfect. The church, its leaders, they're not going to be perfect. Gossiping, not reaching out, giving nothing, not caring about the community, being a hypocrite, and only supporting what you love is not going to help anybody. And I'm going to start, or I'm going to end where I started. I don't believe there's a person here today that says, I sure hope I can bring problems into the church. So here's how I'm going to end today. Because I know nobody's going to respond to this altar call. Because I just know how these games work. So I'm going to ask you all to come forward. Just everybody, just walk forward and join me up here.